Yeah, well, our next talk is held by Harold Flake um, about malware. I think he doesn't need too much introduction, uh, so it's going to be a great talk. Enjoy. <laughs> One second. Yay. All right, good morning. My name is Halvar. Uh, I work for a company called Dynamics in Bochum, and um, I'm going to speak about structural malware classification. Um, essentially dealing with large quantities of malware variants um, in an automated manner. And um, all right, I'll begin this talk by speaking a little bit about how hacking has changed in the last um, 20 years, and not always for the better. Um, if we look at, at the history of it all, um, computer break-ins have changed in their structure. In the 80s and 90s, there were essentially three types of people you would meet on, on other systems. Um, you'd have the, the classical hacker, which were people that were sitting at home and were just enthusiastic about technology and enthusiastic about other people's computers. Um, then you had the, the government types, which uh, were fairly professional in their, in their break-ins, and yet the classical virus authors. And um, the, the interesting thing about break-ins in the 80s and 90s is that almost all break-ins that you saw were not economically motivated, which means that um, the classical hackers wanted to break into something, get access, and use that to break into more things and get access. They were not really, they didn't really care that much about making money. I mean, you had the, the occasional credit card fraud case, but really it was more about getting access and retaining access than, than it was about um, getting profit from it. Um, well, the spooks want nothing more than, than secrecy, really. They want to go into another system, exfiltrate information, and then, um, well, leave again. And the classical virus author um, was more concerned with his reputation amongst the virus writing community than he was about um, making money. He was primarily there for um, getting the, the fame associated with a particularly clever invention. Um, now, nowadays things uh, look different. Um, when, when I was young, the malware that you looked at was usually quite clever. Um, most of it was handwritten in assembly, and people put a tremendous effort into um, these little pieces of code. Um, my, my personal favorites um, were the mutation engine uh, MTE, which uh, some guy in, was it Bulgaria, um, built back in the days. And most of what I know about uh, Windows exception handling came from reading the Win32 Cabinet source code, which, um, well, Win32 Cabinet was uh, the first virus to use um, exception handling to make sure that it doesn't crash while infecting. Um, and then you yeah, had uh, something like Zmist, uh, which is probably the, the best metamorphic engine that it, um, has ever been publicly released in, in, into the wild, which was um, a full disassembler written in assembly that would take an executable, disassemble it, build all cross-references for it, then infect that executable, and then mutate the entire executable. The, the reason for this was that at the time, AV folks started looking for statistical patterns in, in binary, so they um, would sweep over a binary, and when they noticed, um, well, statistically deviant code at the end of it, they were like, hey, we have an infection. So in order to make sure that uh, the code of the virus did not deviate from the code of the application itself, Zmist would just take the executable and morph it as a whole. So everything would look like garbage, and not just the, the polymorphic stuff at the end. Um, and, well, I hate to sound like an, an old dirtbag, but uh, when I was younger, malware didn't suck quite as badly as it does now. Um, in the sense that malware is no longer written for fun, and um, is mostly written for economic motives, and that actually decreases quality to a certain extent, um, as people, well, they have to make money with these things. So, malware is created under economic constraints all of a sudden. Um, and it's, it's built under the, the most bang for the buck thing. Um, which is interesting because malware development starts to resemble more and more regular development. So, um, you have no more difficult to maintain assembly snip snippets, you have uh, C++ code, you have a release cycle, um, and you release something, and you fix, or you notice an issue, and then you release an update, and so forth. And um, I'm quite sure that they have like proper development teams and development plans now. I mean, you see um, specific variants that behave differently, targeted at um, events like Halloween or Thanksgiving, which means somewhere in Russia there's a team of people and they have like a big calendar and they're like, okay, this feature has to be in this worm by next week, right? So, <laughs> and I'm quite sure they have project managers and the like there now. So it's 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 not not what it used to be in that sense. Like they, it's it's real development and. Um, that makes it kind of interesting. 
Now, the thing with AV is that antivirus is it's a rather interesting industry. It's, it's huge financially. I mean, uh, I read some crazy statistics that 55% of all security spending within Europe goes to antivirus. And 55% uh, of all security spending in Europe, that's a, a big chunk. Now, the amusing thing about antivirus is that technically, there hasn't been a whole lot of movement since the 80s. In, in essence, we're, we're still um, wearing jackets with shoulder pads and long hair. Um, what we have is we have still the, the byte, byte by byte scanning engines underneath it all. We have many more signatures and um, a lot of, of rather, rather amusing um, and, and trivial patents. But really, nothing much has changed. Um, we still have essentially a string of bytes with a bunch of wildcards, um, not even a full regular expression, just a string of bytes with a bunch of wildcards, and perhaps some extra instructions on where to look for what features. And um, these things get compiled into a big tri um, tree, tree-like structure, and then you run over a gazillion files and, and look up, hey, is this exactly the byte sequence that we know? Um, these signatures have two disadvantages. First of all, they're very brittle. Um, what do I mean with brittle? They break very easily. Like a minor change will make the signature completely useless. And secondly, they're very localized. You're only running a signature over a very small portion of the executable. Now, this means that an attacker only has to change that small section of the executable and he can reuse 90% of his code. So if you have um, your, well, developers have cooked up 250,000 lines of code for your bot, um, you really just have to change one function and you're right where you used to be. Now, um, finding, or like extracting signatures from antivirus engines is, is really easy with a black box attack. Um, storage is re really, really cheap these days. So you have your bot, you've just built it, and um, you notice, hey, the AV guys are starting to, to add signatures to the engines, and you would like to know, what do I need to change? So what you do is you take a file, and let's say it's got a size of like 70K. Now you make 70,000 copies of it, flipping one byte at a time in that file, and scan it again. And now the, the AV will flag uh, 69,500 something of these files as infected, and a few of them as not. And yay, you have just isolated those bytes that are responsible for identifying this thing as bad. And um, what you do then is you look at your, um, your debug symbols, you have the source code, so you have the debugging symbols, and you get a list of functions that you need to recompile with different compilation options, and then release the bot again. So this entire process of offline polymorphism can be automated in that sense. And um, I'm actually rather sure that this is already being done. So um, the, the cycle goes like this. AV releases a signature update, and they do it, I don't know how often now, twice a day, three times a day. The bandwidth costs must be gigantic. So the malware authors, of course, uh, subscribe to the AV engines. Um, having that subscription isn't all that expensive, really. And um, they notice our malware gets detected. They um, create a few duplicates of that file. Then they use the debug symbols to look up, hey, which functions do we need to change and recompile? And they do that, and they recompile, and they release. And the entire cycle took about half a day, and we have a new variant. And now the AV guys have to take that sample again and extract a new signature. Um, it's, it's a great business model for the AVs, because they can make um, it very plausible to their users that they need to update their signatures all the time. And um, it doesn't really hurt the other side either. So um, when you, you have signatures for malware, you really do not want them to be brittle or local. Meaning the true criteria that you want for a signature is you should be reasonably flexible when people start changing stuff. And you should cover most of the executable and not only a small part of it. All right. So um, yeah, there's a bunch of different, different methods for um, automated malware classification under consideration nowadays. Seems to be a, a rather popular topic. And um, there's in, in the whole about four research directions that, that I've seen, and I'll speak about the first three ones first, and then I'll speak a little bit about what we're doing. Um, I'll, before I start, I'll um, say one thing. The goal of um, a malware classification engine has to be that um, the malware authors cannot use the standard dev tools anymore. Right now they're using standard compilers and they're just recompiling with minor changes. 
Um, we can't make malware detection like 100% reliable if we have a sophisticated attacker with enough resources. The goal really is to get the malware authors to have to do something clever, like not use just the compiler for polymorphism, but disassemble and, and mutate their own code again. The goal is not to have something perfect. The goal is to uh, break the use of cheap tools. All right, so something that's very, very popular these days is behavioral classification. Behavioral classification, in essence, works by executing the malware in a sandbox and recording events as they occur, and then ordering these events into a sequence. And when you have a, a sequence of events, you can calculate a distance between two sequences by something called the Levenstein distance. Levenstein distance is a fancy word for how many insertions and swaps do I need in order to transform one sequence into another. And um, in essence, that's just what you do. You have these sequences, you calculate the Levenstein distance, and um, you weigh the events with different weights, so some events um, affect the distance more than others. And then you sum it up and you get some sort of distance. Now, the problem with behavioral classification, well, I'll start with the, the, the pros first. Um, the, the advantages of behavioral classification are um, you really don't care what, um, like over how many executables your malware is spread. You don't care um, whether it's spread over multiple processes. You just collect events system-wide and then start, start comparing. Um, secondly, uh, behavior extraction is comparatively easy. The downside is um, you have to run the software and it has to be active in order to be observed. So if you're in a forensic situation where you find a rootkit on somebody's box, in, like, or a suspicious piece of kernel memory that is executable and that shouldn't be there, um, this really doesn't exhibit any behavior at that point, so you can't do anything with it. Secondly, uh, a lot of malware, when you see it nowadays, just doesn't do anything for a significant portion of time before it actually starts doing something. So behavioral classification at that point is not going to be quite, quite so successful. The biggest problem that I see, though, is that behavioral classification can be trivially fooled. I don't even need to recompile my executable. I can just randomize behavior a little bit, and out of a sudden, an executable is not even self-similar anymore. So these, these five lines of C code down here, um, will essentially make an executable not self-similar. You just start the executable, you run it, and then you open and close random files for a while. And, well, each of these operations is going to be an event, and uh, you have a random number of how often you do this, so out of a sudden, um, your two sequences are arbitrarily far away from each other with this distance, and you're running the same executable twice. So uh, that doesn't quite fit the bill. Um, a different approach, is something called n-grams and n-perms. Uh, one question, is there a glass of water somewhere around? I've... Right. Thank you. Apologies, I was invited to some drinking yesterday evening and I haven't quite recovered yet. All right, so n-grams and n-perms. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the idea behind n-grams and n-perms is um, you go through an executable and you count how many, and how many times an unordered sequence of instruction occurs. So, um, for example, you want to calculate the five perms uh, or five instruction perms of an executable, which means you're looking at all possible permutations of um, all possible instructions of length five, and then you count how often each one of these occurs in that executable. And then you get a very, very high dimensional vector uh, with one dimension for each possible, possible permutation of uh, five instructions. Um, and um, well, then you start comparing these vectors. And um, that actually works somewhat. The idea be behind using this is, well, compilers rearrange instructions. So by not considering ordered sequences of instructions, but unordered sequences, we might actually be able to compare even though the compiler is reordering stuff. Um, so yeah, you go through the executable, you count how often these things occur. And the problem is that your, the dim dimension of that vector is so ridiculously large that um, you now have to come up with a clever way of comparing these things because the standard methods don't quite work that well. And um, what they're doing, in fact, is they're calculating the cosine angle between these two vectors. And that means, okay, we have these two very high dimensional vectors and we don't really know whether they're the same and comparing them is stupidly expensive. So we'll just see, ah, do they point in roughly the same direction? And then start working with that. Um, 
Now, the problem with this initially is that there's many very common code sequences um, that are generated all the time. Function prologs and 